I know you all want to cheer for the announcements, don't you? It's okay. It's okay. We love, we love our Pastor Courtney. She's, she's amazing. And she broke Pastor Kerry in. You know, he's, he's okay on camera too. But that dog makes, 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 the, makes the gig for him. Lincoln the dog. Hey. In the, in the lobby, you'll find today that there is some tables set up with baked goods, and we've got some students. Pastor Courtney was talking about kids doing, uh, raising money for the Big Give Day for, for Children's Missions, BGMC. And so there's a table filled with goodies out there. I've been told that if you eat that in the sanctuary, well, you shouldn't eat it in the sanctuary. But if you wanted to try, I heard that there's no calories. If you buy it for missions, and eat, and I, don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't think it's true. Hey, for those that are joining online, welcome. We're glad uh, that you've joined us here this morning. I am excited to be able to bring a message to you this morning. We're continuing in our series in 1 Peter. If you've missed the last three weeks, we've done a sermon on each chapter so far, one, two, and three. Uh, If you missed any of those, I encourage you to take the time, go back and catch up, listen to those. They're phenomenal messages. Let me just tell you, uh, there is some, some great truth for us to learn about holiness, about the fact that we're chosen by God, that he gives us direction and wisdom, how that we interact as husbands and wives. And uh, Pastor Luke did a phenomenal job last week, if you, especially if you missed that. I encourage you, that's a message that we all need to hear. And uh, so this morning we are in First Peter chapter 4. If you want to turn in your Bibles there, we'll get to that scripture reading in just a moment. But the subject that I'm speaking on this morning is suffering. I'm thinking about the song that uh, we sang earlier, the hymn, uh, and, the, and the lyric of that one, the last verse. If the ocean were filled with ink and the skies were made of parchment, we would drain the ocean telling of all the good things that God has done, of his love and all that he is to us. We would drain the ocean. Think about that. We know that God loves us. God is so good and he's done so many great things. He's provided for us and he's a deliverer, he's a healer, he's done so many things and we have so much to look forward to because of what he's done, his great love for us. But when we, when we think of his great love and then we talk about suffering, it's like how do we reconcile those two things together? If God loves us so much, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so many problems? Why do people struggle so much? Every one of us has experienced suffering on some level, whether it's a death in your family, a death of a friend, sickness, cancer, disease, being persecuted for your faith. Suffering is something that all of us are familiar with on some level, and the Bible has a lot to say about suffering. But in order for us to understand suffering properly, why so many people suffer, we need a correct view of God and of the current state of humanity. The Bible tells us that God is gracious. God is merciful. He's mighty. He's slow to anger. He's sovereign. He's loving. He's powerful. And so much more. The Bible tells us that there is no darkness in God at all that he cannot sin. And when you consider the heart of God, you see that it's not his nature to torture us. It's not his nature to cause people to suffer. Instead, we see that he uses suffering to draw his people closer to himself. When sin entered the world, pain and suffering were the consequence of that sin. You can go back and read in Genesis. When they sinned in the garden, all of a sudden, now there's going to be pain in childbirth. Now we're going to have to work the ground because it's infested with all kinds of weeds and and all the struggles that go along with sin. It's the consequence of sin. Now we experience many levels of suffering in our life. Bodily pain, sickness, mental illness, death, persecution for our faith. Suffering is the result of the fall of mankind. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, that no one is good, that we've all sinned, we all fall short of his glory. We don't deserve anything good because all of humanity is inherently evil. And I said God is sovereign, which means that he's in control and he can do whatever he wants to do. He is loving and he doesn't enjoy watching any of us go through suffering, but he is faithful. And he uses those tests and those trials and the suffering to test our faith, 
to grow us, to shape us, to mold us, to mature us, and to make us more like him. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. He takes what the enemy intended for evil, and he has a way of turning it for our good and for his glory. That's our God. He will use even suffering to draw us closer to himself. At the end of the, of the service, we're gonna end in prayer. And I don't know what you're facing, what you're going through, maybe the trial, the struggle, uh, the difficulty that you're facing, whether it's a physical sickness, whether it's a, an emotional thing, whether it's something in your family or it's financial, whatever it might be, no matter how big or small, we know that our God is working for us. He is working in our lives. He is working things together for good. Even when you feel like you're facing a mountain and you don't know that there's any way possible you can make it over or through that mountain. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is our God, so we're gonna pray. We're gonna ask God for miracles, and we're gonna believe for great things. Uh, First Peter chapter four, are you there? All right, we're gonna read through the chapter. A lot to say about suffering. In the book of First Peter alone, 21 times he mentions suffering. I think it's something that we need to take notice of this morning. It's something that the church, we need to talk a lot more about because there is suffering in the world. How do we respond to that? What is a godly perspective in this? This is what Peter says, verse one. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You've had enough in the past of evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do, so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God who will judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead, so that although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever amen dear friends don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through as if something strange were happening to you instead be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world so be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian for then the glorious spirit of God rests upon you if you suffer however it must not be for murder stealing making trouble or prying into other people's affairs but it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian praise God for the privilege of being called by his name for the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household and if judgment begins with us what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to the godless sinners? So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. Man, there's a lot of good stuff to unpack here. And I don't have enough time to to do it all, but I'm gonna try to, to give you as much information as I can and encourage you in this fact that, you know, all of us in this world, we face troubles, we face uh, suffering, and how we respond to that is important. Perhaps um, one of the greatest stories of deliverance in the Bible is, a, is the fiery trial that we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go through in Daniel. Peter said, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. I mean, this was a fiery trial, a literal fiery trial. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're unfamiliar with the story, it's found in Daniel chapter three. But these three were commanded by King Nebuchadnezzar to worship a golden idol that he had built, 90 feet tall, nine feet wide, and he commanded everybody to worship before this idol. And anybody who refused to do so would be thrown into a furnace of fire. 
Here's what we need to know this morning as we look at this whole topic of suffering. Sometimes God delivers us from the fire. Sometimes God delivers us from the fire, but oftentimes he chooses to deliver us through the fire. That's what we're focusing on in this message. So whatever kind of fire or trial or suffering that you face today, know that God can deliver you from it. And I believe it's appropriate for us to always pray for a miracle because God is limitless in what he can do. He can do anything. So for us to have the kind of faith to say, God, I know that you can move this mountain. God, I know that you can change my circumstances. God, I know that you can remove me from this trial. But here's what we can say for sure. Whether he does that or not, he, will prom- he promises to deliver us through that fire, through that trial. Jesus prayed in the garden before his arrest. He said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Proverbs 17, three says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. He's all about refining his people. Peter said in in chapter one, he said, be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. So God uses the fire of trials, of tests, of suffering to refine us. He'd already done this with Rack, Shack, and Benny. Those guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I borrowed that from VeggieTales, just to wake you up. <laughs> he had been preparing them ahead of time. If you read chapters one and two of Daniel, they had already resolved to not defile their hearts with the king's food. God had blessed them for that. They had learned that when they honored God, that God would honor them. And when they encountered this, tr- this trial, this test, this fire, literally a literal fire, seven times hotter, the king had, had stoked it up. Their faith had been so strengthened that they didn't hesitate to stand against the king and to stand for God. They had determined. They trusted God no matter what. They obeyed God no matter what. No matter what. It was a matter of obedience. They were not willing to compromise God's commands. They knew the commands, the first two of of God's top 10 commands. He said, you must not have any other God but me. And you must not bow down to any idol or worship any idol. And we should not be willing to compromise our faith, our faith in Jesus as our God and Savior. They took a stand and God came through. They took a stand for God and he came through. He was a deliverer. He's an amazing God. I wanna ask, is there a chance, do you think, I wonder what what you think, will we ever have to face something like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where where we're asked to deny our faith and worship something else? You asked me 10 years ago, and I said, no way. I'm not so sure that in our lifetimes today, we might not face the same kind of persecution for our faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face, where we were told, you do this or else. And what do you do? What do you do in that moment? If you haven't decided right now, this day, today, what's gonna happen when that day comes, if it should ever, if it should ever come? But can you say, I will stand, and I will take a stand, and I will be strong, and I'll be bold in my faith? Peter said, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. I don't know about you, but I, I, I have trouble with that sometimes. I'm often surprised when I find myself in situations where I might be wondering, why me? Don't tell me you've never asked that question before. You're in the midst of something and you're saying, what did I do? What did I do? And why is God doing this to me? Why me? Honest, have you ever felt that way? You maybe thought that way thinking, okay, I've, I've done something wrong and God's mad at me. That's why I'm facing this thing. Peter said, don't be surprised. They're gonna come, the fiery trials are gonna come. But the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was boldness and confidence. They weren't asking, oh, poor, poor us, why us? They were confident and they stood. This is what they said to Nebuchadnezzar. 
Oh, king, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us. That's boldness. I don't know if you're facing a fire, a literal fire, and you could be thrown into the fire. Would it make you think twice? Back up a moment and say, do I, what, am, what do I really believe at this moment? Is God really real? Am I okay going into that furnace? This is what their mind said, their heart said. They've been trained for this. They've trained themselves for this. Honor God. Don't bow to an idol. Listen, our God is able to save us from this fire. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. Can you say in your faith, you resolve to say, I'm never, never bowing. I'm never giving up on God. And I will stand with that boldness and believe God for great things. Obviously, they had been prepared in advance for this and they resolved in their hearts that no matter what happened, no matter what fiery trial that they would find themselves in, they would endure and they wouldn't compromise. How about you? How about us? Are we prepared for that? Do you know how you would answer the demand to deny your faith? Jesus said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before the Father in heaven. Shouldn't be a question for us. Our God is able. But even if he doesn't save us, Like I said, 21 times in 1 Peter, he mentions this idea of suffering in the context of our faith. I want to remind you at this time when Peter's writing, Nero is emperor of Rome. Nero, who murdered his mom. Nero, who murdered two of his wives. One of them he kicked to death when she was pregnant. Nero, who was all about persecuting Christians, who thought it nothing to dip them in tar, impale them on a pole, and use them to light up his garden at night. Suffering? I don't think we've experienced that kind of suffering. It was Peter who, at the possibility of suffering for Christ, Jesus had been rested, and it was this little girl that said, hey, I think you're one of his disciples. He denied Jesus in his moment of need. He denied him right there. This is Peter, the one who's saying, be bold, the one who's saying, listen, be willing to suffer anything. And from this point on to where Peter's right in here, he's suffered a lot, and he's willing to suffer anything, and he's preparing believers to suffer as well. A lot of Christians have this idea in their minds, and some even teach that as Christians, we, we should experience health and prosperity, that we should experience peace and tranquility. And if that's, if that's what you think, that as Christians, that's, that should be the goal, then, then uh, suffering is only, it, it only means your failure as a Christian. I should be this way. It only means that God has not met your expectation, brings frustration. And some people falsely teach that suffering is the result of sin. It's a lack of faith, and it's the anger of God toward you. But I want you to think about the blind man in John chapter 9. As they were walking past this blind man, the disciples said to him, uh, Master, who, who sinned? Who sinned? Why is he blind? Is it his sin or is it the sin of his parents? And what did Jesus say? Neither. It wasn't sin that caused him to be blind. He's blind to show the power of God. And it was at that moment that Jesus put mud in his eyes and said, go wash in the water. And the guy who had been blind from birth could now see. It was an opportunity for God to show his power. We see in Acts chapter five, the apostles rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer shame and disgrace at the name of Jesus. You see, our human nature wants comfort and peace. And we attempt to avoid suffering at any cost. Listen to me, I don't wanna suffer. I don't know what you think. I don't know if you're for that. I don't think anybody, any of us wants to suffer. It's not in our nature. It's not what we want to do, but suffering is part of life. We live in a fallen world, a world that is at war with God. Satan is a, a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a cheater. He distorts the truth. He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out to do anything he can to take your faith and cause you to stumble and cause you to fall and give up on your faith in God. He will do 
anything he can. But we have this hope from scripture that one day God will restore everything. The road to eternity passes through hardships and suffering. Jesus made it clear. He said, in, I, I, I've told you all this so that in me you may have peace. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. Peter said, watch, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. And in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. That's our God. There's a lot of examples for us to follow in scripture. We've got the prophets. We've got the apostles. We've got Job, a lot of examples, but the greatest example of suffering is Christ himself. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one to three. Now in chapter 11, it gives us a whole list of people the, 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 who lived by faith. But in chapter 12, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility that he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and give up. We need to remember Christ. He is our great example. You think Jesus found joy in the cross? Do you think the apostles found joy in suffering, the prophets and the shame that they were forced to endure? The joy that they found, each of them that they found, wasn't in the circumstances. It was what came as a result of enduring. See, Jesus endured the cross. That was his earthly mission. He came to give his life, to endure the cross for us. He saw beyond the cross. He saw our redemption and the glory that we will one day share with him. That's why the apostles uh, endured the beatings and the, and the prison terms that they, that they suffered through because they knew that the testing of their faith, it was gonna, it was gonna bring them uh, a, a reward. Second Corinthians chapter four, Paul says this, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. One version says our light and momentary troubles. They won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will, and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we see now, rather we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things that we now see will soon be gone, but the things that we cannot see will last forever. Paul also said in Romans chapter eight, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. So we know that it is working for us our, our good. God is working through the suffering to shape us, to refine us, to make us, and to uh, give us something as a result. There are benefits to suffering, and I'm gonna ask them just to throw that slide up on the screen because I, uh, I don't have time to go through all of these, but if you go back and read uh, those verses, one through 14 of First Peter, if you wanna take a picture of that, go back, take some time to go back and look through that. It says suffering loosens sin's grip on us. Listen, when we have experienced When we have experienced what God has done in our life, it should change us. Sin loses its appeal. There was a guy known as the life of the party, he played on a local softball team and he was the one who would often buy the keg. And it was when his three-year-old daughter was hit and killed by a drunk driver, he lost his heart for partying no longer interested in the keggers after the softball games. He actually found himself despising the places which he once was attracted to when he saw the reality of what drunkenness and partying did to his own family. And that's what happens. We see the effects and the results of sin. Paul said, arm yourselves with the same attitude that Christ had. 
Arm yourselves. Take up the weapon. The weapon is the attitude that Christ had, the attitude that I'm going to endure through this because it's going it's to bring great things as a result. It causes others to see us differently. When there's a change in us, they, they're going to see something different in us. And we no longer want to spend our life on, the, on trivial things. Other people notice that. Suffering keeps us focused on eternity. You ever been going through a difficult time and think, Lord, this would be a great time for you to return? This would be a great time. Heaven looks all the better. When things are smooth, seems like you're gliding through life, everything's okay. I'm sure we don't think about heaven quite as much. Suffering keeps us focused on eternity and allows us to experience God's joy and his glory. Listen, nobody ever said if someone announces that they're pregnant and they're gonna have a baby, who says to that person, oh, I feel bad for you. There's a lot of pain you're gonna go through. You realize how much that child's gonna cost you? You're gonna lose a lot of money. There's gonna be a lot of sleepless nights. I feel sorry for you. Said no one, right? We're happy, we're joyful. This is the thing the Bible even says. You know, this is the joy. You go through that labor, that pain, but in a moment when that child comes, all of that you kind of forget for the moment. There's joy through the suffering, and we don't say, oh, man, I've got to endure this, and then it's just like downhill from here. The suffering that we face is worthwhile. None of us want to, none of us love to suffer, and I want to, I want to end just with a, with a personal story, and I'm thinking, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things in, in my life that I could talk to you about. I could spend the day telling you about life stories, and I'm sure if we had time to share, we, we all have a long list of things that we have experienced in life that wasn't fun, that was very, very difficult. But to be able to see on the other side sometimes what we couldn't see on the front side. Many of you may not know that Jeannie and I struggle with infertility. And you're thinking, you have five children. Yeah, there was a time, it was very, very different for us. And I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I grew up in church. Jeannie grew up in church. We met each other. And we had both, we had both decided early on in our lives to save ourselves from marriage. And I've got to be honest that when we, were, when we were trying to conceive and we couldn't conceive, it's, it's difficult to not go to that place and say, God, I, I, I've tried to do everything right. And this is, and this is what we get. I had a, at the, at the same time we were going through that, there was a girl in our youth group, 15 years old, that got pregnant. She didn't want her baby, obviously. That's, it's so hard for someone that's facing those, those battles. We had a, a friend who uh, was in our church who was one of our youth leaders who wrote us a letter when we were through the struggle. They had about five or six kids at the time. And this is what he said. He said, God gives children to those who he feels should have them. And he doesn't give kids to those he feels shouldn't have them. Can I tell you that hurt? A lot. Jeannie's, Jeannie's words, she said, through that whole time, I knew deep down God wasn't doing this to us. And as I look back, God has given us five children through fertility treatments, through adoption. We had a surprise pregnancy and we've had a surprise adoption. We've experienced all of that. Each one of our five kids all have their own miracle story. Brianna, our, our middle child, sitting, she's sitting back there in the sound booth controlling something today. I think it's the light that's making me look better. <laughs> <laughs> Help me, please. <laughs> Brianna, Brianna was... Um, not, not supposed to happen. We were told, we, we, we went to multiple um, fertility doctors and we were told 99.9% .9 chance you will never become pregnant. Um, not even fertility medication because Zach, our oldest, was conceived with fertility medication. And then we tried for two and a half years with no success. We adopted our daughter, Mackenzie. And we had a moment where, you know, Jeannie, Jeannie said to me, She's only been pregnant one time in her life at this point. She said, if I, if I didn't know better, I would think I'm pregnant. But we knew that that was not even a possibility until it was a reality. 
God bless us with, with uh, a, another child. But two weeks after Brianna was born, Jeannie began hemorrhaging and had to have an emergency hysterectomy and nearly didn't survive that. She, when I saw her after her second surgery, she had, was being infused in one into each arm, her hemoglobin, and got as low as four. And when I saw her, she was just as gray as can be. And the nurse said, her color's looking really good. I nearly fainted and, you know, the reality hit me all of a sudden. This, this, this is unbelievable. Two weeks after uh, giving birth to our child and the doctor said her uterus was so gray and mushy, he said, there is no way we can understand how um, it sustained a full-term healthy pregnancy. God did it. Amen. Eight weeks, Jeannie has reminded me, eight weeks after Brianna was born, she, um, she was having some issues with uh, reflux. And we had taken her to our, our pediatrician. And uh, I can't remember, John, you won't remember that, but I think her white blood count was like 42,000, which I think, I think is, it, maybe it was 142,000. I don't know what high white count is. 42 is high, I think, yes. And um, this is just a few weeks after Jeannie has gone through all of this and uh, they were, John sent us to the hospital thinking maybe there's infection, maybe it could be meningitis. And Jeannie said, Jeannie said, this is what I remember. I remember looking at John and saying, I can't do this. Do you know what I've been through? And I, his comment was, what scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Thankful for a godly pediatrician. And Jeannie's and I, we've, the song that has meant so much to us in this was the song, uh, Through It All. Through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all. I've learned to stand on his word. Here's what I know. There is suffering in the world and there's problems. And we will never get away from that in this world. But God's promises are good and true. And what we can't see on the front side, we will gain a perspective. If it's not in this world, it'll be an eternal life to come. But we can always say that our God is good, that he is faithful, and that through the suffering, through the trials, through the difficulties, through the disappointments, through the discouragements that we face, he will always work things together for good. This is our story. Other people have had different stories. But here's what I can tell you, God is faithful and he is good, and there is nothing that God can't do. He will either deliver you from that fiery trial or he'll deliver you through that, and it will always be good. I wonder how many of you would say, there's, there's something in your life, you're facing a battle, you're, it's a storm, it's a fire, it feels like a mountain that's in your way, and you don't know how you're gonna get through this. How many of you would say that you're facing difficult things like that? How many of you would say you, you need healing from, from God for a sickness or cancer or disease or whatever it might be. You need God to intervene in your circumstances. Let's believe God to do those things. We, we are not going to get away from suffering. It's just an opportunity, just like the blind man, Jesus said. It's an opportunity for me to show my power. God wants to work today. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to set people free. Unjust suffering is one of those things that can grip the hearts of people. The struggle. We struggle with frustration, anger, uncertainty. Trials that unexpectedly show up on our doorstep can really get us down. But by faith today, we can see that it's an opportunity for God to respond for God to heal, for God to deliver, for God to restore. By faith, we can see through and imagine and believe what God can do. And here's what I can tell you. He can do way beyond what you can imagine or think. In your wildest dreams, God can do that. It may seem difficult to imagine it at this stage of the game, at this point in your life, at this point in the struggle, but you can imagine what you can imagine God can do even better. Amen. We need to persevere. That's what Peter is encouraging us to do, to push through those troubles, to recognize that they're temporary. 
Don't be surprised. Walk in holiness. Live as people of faith. Father, today we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, God, that though we face the mountain, you can cast the mountain into the sea. Though we face a fiery furnace, God, you are able to deliver us from that. And God, you are certainly able to deliver us through that. And so no matter what we're facing, every person that has come forward for prayer, those that are joining online, that are even praying at this moment, believing you, God, for a breakthrough, we know that you are a great provider. You have provided everything that we have need of. You are good. Your love is great for us, and we trust you. So no matter what we face, we know that you're greater. And it, through that test, God, you are building a testimony for our lives of your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want to continue to pray? You certainly can. I know we didn't get to pray with absolutely everybody, but... Um, Let's have a different mindset. Let's arm ourselves with the mindset of Christ and let's believe him, trust him, amen. I bless you.